Dover Harbour earlier on today after arriving in the early hours of this morning. UK Border Force spent the day on what they're calling Red Alert during what's been an extremely busy time for migrant activity. A man has been arrested on suspicion of collecting information likely to be useful to terrorists following the PSNI data breach. The 39-year-old man has been detained following a search in Lurgan in County Armagh. He's now being questioned in Belfast. Last week, the details of 10,000 police officers and staff were published online by mistake, followed by a second breach relating to stolen documents and a laptop. A member of staff has been dismissed and the Metropolitan Police are investigating after a number of items from the British Museum in London were found to be missing, stolen or damaged. In a statement, the museum said this afternoon that the items included gold, jewellery, semi-precious stones and glass dating from the 15th to the 19th century. The museum has described them as small pieces, not recently on public display, and were mainly used for research and academic work. It's launched its own independent review of security following the incident. Economists say the UK still faces a very real risk of falling into recession, despite today's drop in inflation. The Prime Minister says today's inflation figures, which doesn't include housing costs, like mortgage payments, for example, proves that the government's plan is working. A leading think tank, though, has warned that rising interest rates could cause the economy to contract. Latest figures from the Office for National Statistics found consumer price index inflation, or CPI, dropped to 6.8% during the year to July. And a comedy show featuring the comedy writer Graham Linehan that was cancelled at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival has now found a new venue. Ticket holders are going to be informed of the new location for tomorrow's show shortly before it begins. Speaking to GB News earlier on today, Graham Linehan said he thought the days of comedians being silenced for their views were over. They could have given me a chance to uh, exit the gig and allow uh, the other acts to perform. They could have uh, done it without uh, uh, defaming me on their Instagram post as a bigot, um, which is the first thing these people always do. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, we are, we are beginning legal proceedings. Before I go, a quick weather warning for you. A thunderstorm is set to hit parts of the UK. In fact, a yellow wind warning has been issued for the west of Wales, with storms expected to hit late on Friday evening, sweeping right across the country into the early hours of Saturday. But it isn't all bad news. Those clouds are expected to clear in time to give us a sunny weekend. This is GB News across the UK on your TV, in your car, on your digital radio and now on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. This is Britain's News Channel. Well, we're through 17,000 people across the English Channel so far this year. A calm day, hundreds into Dover. In a moment, we'll go and join Mark White, who is down there in Dover docks. But we're literally being openly mocked and laughed at. Let's have a look at this series of videos on TikTok. The first one shows young men assembling near the beaches of northern France last night. Have a look at this. Right. So, as you can see, large group of young men, not a woman in sight, not a child in sight, large group of young men last night getting ready to cross the channel. They've all paid the trafficker three and a half grand. Here they are now on the boat, somewhere on average now about 65 to a boat. Here they are crossing the channel. It's thumbs up, big smile, it's Jerabang day out. And now they've been picked up by the RNLI. Yes, big waves, happy as Larry. Off to a four-star hotel, three square meals a day and 40 quid a week, spending money. And they're literally mocking us openly on TikTok. And there's nothing the social media channel can do. Even when they take down the accounts, more appear. And these are all adverts. You know, come to the UK, it's easy, it's safe. Yes, the odd thing goes wrong. Um, and I just feel we're being mocked. And it's now over 100,000 young men that have come. But please don't call it an invasion. Oh, no, no, no. If you use that word, everybody goes potty and says you're an extremist and a racist because these are all poor, suffering people. In fact, the BBC always tell us these are desperate people. Well, none of them in those videos 
looked too desperate to me. I wonder, would it ever stop? After all, the Home Office think it might go on for five years. Your thoughts, please, farage at gbnews.com. Now, Mark White, our Home and Security Editor, has been down in Dover Docks for at least 12 hours today. Mark, um, a red alert day for Border Force and the others. It was a pretty busy morning, wasn't it? Yes, it was, with at least eight small boats coming across, Nigel. And we uh, counted some of those boats, four uh, of the boats had upwards of 60, uh, one even 65 people on board. And that's clearly uh, a continuation of this trend by the people smugglers to push even more people onto these boats. They're slightly bigger, they're a bit more sturdy, but when you get numbers like that on the boats, it doesn't take much at all for that boat to get into difficulties, as we saw, of course, just at the weekend there on Saturday. As we speak, the French patrols are out on the other side of the channel. They're expecting the possibility uh, that we could get an evening surge uh, yeah. as well coming over from France. Yeah, I'd be surprised, Mark, if we don't get boats coming this evening because there is, in fact, uh, some easterly wind that starts to pick up tomorrow and onwards. Um, now, what's really interesting, there's one big change here. Yesterday was the second anniversary of the Taliban retaking Kabul after Biden's disastrous withdrawal. And it would appear now, the num not only the number of Afghans that are coming across the channel, but it appears they're winning the turf wars over in Calais. Yes, well, I mean, I wouldn't really uh, necessarily say they're winning the turf wars, but they're certainly, in some cases, trying to take the fight uh, to some of the uh, Kurdish people smugglers who have really been in control of the people smuggling routes for years now. And as bizarre as it seems, I actually bumped into three Iraqi Kurds, all cousins. Uh, two had come across in lorries eight years ago, one on a small boat uh, two years ago. Uh, that person still waiting for their asylum uh, process uh, to, to complete. Uh, they've come here for a picnic. Uh, they all live in different parts of the country. They wanted to meet up, so they're overlooking the very channel that they a crossed. Picnic. Um, and I was asking them, they didn't, they didn't want to appear, a picnic, yeah, they didn't want to appear uh, on camera, but they were happy to chat. And they were telling me about the, their fellow Kurds, Iraqi Kurds, who control a lot of these camps around Dunkirk uh, and even in Cali, and how increasingly they are arming themselves, that there is a lot of infighting that's breaking out, mainly between the Kurdish gangs, uh, disputes over them under cutting each other, uh, invading their particular turf. They, ga you know, jealously guard their particular patch. And they're getting reports from people they still know on the other side who say that they have seen uh, these gang masters wandering about now with weapons. I've been there many times over the mm. years. I've been threatened twice uh, by these uh, criminal gangs, the gang masters with knives, never with guns. And it was only because uh, they didn't like us filming. Uh, but it is a surprise that they are now arming themselves with weapons. But it seems, as you say, the Afghans, who are now the biggest nationality um, represented on these small boats, are themselves trying to get a piece of that action. Yeah, no, quite extraordinary. Well, Mark, I have to say, it looks more like the Mediterranean than Dover uh, from the shots I've got. And, you know, quite ironic, isn't it, really? You know, gunshots on the other side just a few days ago and illegal immigrants picnicking. There we are in Dover. Quite extraordinary. Mark, you could be in for a long evening as well, I think. Thank you for your report from Dover. Now, last night, I talked about the fact that it was exactly a fortnight until the ULES extension comes in. Politically, it's a big issue. The Conservatives held the Uxbridge seat in the recent by-election to the surprise of many. And Labour hold five or six seats right on the periphery of London. This potentially is a big opportunity for the Conservatives. And I talked about Article 143 of the Greater London Authority Act. And it said, says clearly, the Secretary of State can override the Mayor of London on transport policy if the Secretary considers that the strategy or any part of it is inconsistent with national policies. 
and detrimental to any area outside Greater London. Well, the second part of that is, is absolutely confirmed. There are so many people with businesses in counties surrounding London that will be adversely affected by the Euler's extension. The more debatable point is what is our transport policy? But if the government's now saying that it's against this Euler's extension and against it happening in other cities, I can't see what the problem is. <clears throat> I think politically it's a no-brainer for the Conservatives to delay the introduction of ULES and to push it out beyond the mayoral elections next May. But I asked the question last night, would they have the bottle to do it? Well, we have a new kid on the block. Well, he's not that new, really, but he's new to GB News. He's a, vet he's a veteran, actually, <laughs> and his name is Christopher Hope. And Chris <clears throat> joins us as our new political editor. Chris, we've known each other one or two years, <laughs> one <laughs> way or another. Um, you're a man with your ear very close to these things. <clears throat> Are they going to pick up this challenge? The answer to that is no. What's happened here is a challenge here for Mark Harper. He's the transport yep. secretary. He runs the transport network for the, for the whole country. He's got the choice here. Should he step in and try and use this apparent uh, legislation here in Article 1? It's not apparent. Well, it's there, yes, but how you define it. Now, I've been told on very good authority from two very good sources, one very, very close to Mark Harper, that they, they have <coughs> taken legal advice. They've been told they can't use this to stop Mayor Sadiq Khan extending ULES on August 29th. Therefore, it will go ahead. But as you know, politics is a choice, Nigel, mm. and a choice of how we spend uh, the, the public money. It may well be that officials are telling Mark Harper, legally, you can't do it, and therefore he's got a choice. Do I overrule that? Maybe order direction of officials, and that means he can overrule um, on, on, on value for money grounds, and order uh, uh, his officials to say, no, we're going to try and challenge that in the court and test that in the court. Yep. That would be a political choice to make. It might delay the ULES extension for a few months. Don't forget Susan Hall. She's the London mayoral candidate for the Tories. She's promised on day one of her, of, if she wins Sadiq Khan, uh, next May in the local, in the mayoral elections, she will reverse it. So it could delay it until then. But it's a choice that Mark Harper's got to make. And currently, he's not going to do it. Yeah, I mean, the idea that, you know, legal advice says, well, what about entrepreneurship? What about leadership? What about <laughs> caring for the poorer in society? Big numbers of them. Yeah. You know, this idea that only one in ten cars or vans will pay the new ULES charge, that's because only one in ten cars in Ken and Chelsea, mm -hmm. you know... It doesn't account are not for new vehicles cars. crossing the border. That's but, the point. Yeah, but when you go out to the outskirts of yeah. London, people are not as rich as they are in no. Kensington and Chelsea, and it's not one in ten cars, it's three or four. OK, but, um, but the, the, the scrappage scheme, which is done to... If, if yep. Zeke Khan were here now, he'd be saying, I've got a scrappage scheme, I'm going right. to reward vehicles <coughs> within the N25 to get a new car or a new vehicle, a new van, or money towards that, to, so you won't pay the charge. But that doesn't account for vehicles outside in the, the five Labour no. and other areas who drive in no. and drive out. And, 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 equally, they are... and equally, you know, <clears throat> if the scrappage is a couple of grand, but the new car's eight grand, and you haven't got a lot of money... The cars aren't eight grand anymore. That was, like, ten years ago, Nigel. No, well, that. a second-hand, you less compliant okay, car. You might get okay. one. You might get something that's compliant with a few with a lot of miles on the clock yeah. for eight, ten grand. But you're still looking, yeah. actually. It's a, so, the scrappage scheme defers some of the cost, but no more than that. Is this not just an example of a classic sort of wait-and-see style Conservative government? Let's sort of push this down the road, let's wait, let's not make a tough decision. Um, you know, shouldn't Mark Harper be bolder? Well, that's, that, 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 again, we go at that, that political point. Now, if you were Mark Harper, you would be bolder, wouldn't you? You'd take on this. You would. I you would. would drill down to this legal advice. Again, we don't know what the legal advice says. It may be it, may be it says that by dealing with you, there's a distinct point. It means you have to cancel all clean air zones across the UK. We don't know that. That's an idea. We don't know it's true or not, but mm. the, the legal advice is not being given to us. They won't give us legal advice in government. But, yes, it, it may take some political courage to do it, but equally, it looks like the Tories are happy to let Mayor Khan bring this, bring this in. They'll be upset and concerned around those areas around London, and they might benefit from the election if it's in well, May or June saw... or November next year. But it's yeah. too bad. But people won't, won't look back that far. By then, the, the ship has The sailed. damage will have been done. Possibly, yeah. The damage to businesses and others will have been the done. The choice to be made here. Yeah, I saw a Tory MP at lunch, mm. and 
that MP said to me, oh, no, we want to make it an election issue this year. Yeah. It's all about elections yeah. and winning elections and to hell with the people is mm. my How about an anti ulas party funded by Nigel Farage for the next... Well, election? you never know. London you never seat. know. I'm getting angrier and angrier <laughs> with them. Chris, welcome to GB News and to this show. We're going to see a lot more of you. Thank you. I know we are. Thank you. As the months and years go ahead. Well, all I can say is it's just so classic. Chinless, useless gutless leaders, not prepared to take any bold decisions, not prepared to take any risks. If Harper did this, I tell you what, there'd be a huge amount of support for him and for his party, but they think, kick it down the road and Susan Hall will make it an election issue. Have you ever heard of Susan Hall? Had any of you ever heard of Susan Hall until a few weeks ago? What chance has she got of winning next May? Oh dear, oh dear. In a minute, we will talk about debanking. But actually, in this case, it's detanking. <laughs> I promise all will be explained in a couple of minutes. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From six, it's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Well, I asked you, will the cross-channel migrant crisis, or should we now call it an emergency, will it ever stop? Some of your thoughts that have come in. Michael says, I can't speak for all. However, I can speak for many when I say, enough is enough. Ryan says, not whilst this Conservative government, in brackets, does everything it can to avoid the issue. We could solve this in a matter of weeks by simply turning the boats around. Ryan, do you mean to do what Australia did? Because they did it rather successfully. And one more I'll take. Shane says, absolutely sick of this migrant situation. This government has completely let us down. <clears throat> now, I've been giving you the debanking story and telling you that group after group of people have been 
debanked. Many of them, you see, are involved in businesses and industries that, whilst they are perfectly legal, perfectly legal, they are no longer approved of by the so-called ESG agenda. Well, in this case, Will Hollis, our GB News reporter up in the East Midlands, has a case of somebody who has been detanked. Will, tell us the story, please. Yes, well, it's a beautiful evening here in Northamptonshire, Nigel. <coughs> We're in Northamptonshire because it's the home of Tanks A Lot, which is one business that has found itself without a bank account. Nick, you're the owner of Tanks A Lot. You found yourself quite recently without a Barclays bank account as well as a Wise account. Just tell me a little bit about the history of your business, Tanks A Lot, how you came into it and why you think that you've been debanked. Well, 35 years we've been doing everything from private car crushes to corporate days to all the agencies where you buy um, activity vouchers and then um, kids' parties, everything you can think of with tanks. Um, and then suddenly um, this war started with Ukraine and they wanted tanks and we had rather a lot of them. So um, when I say tanks, they're troop carriers and uh, types of command vehicles. Nothing's been sold with a gun on it or with even a smoke discharger. And I think we'd done about 120 vehicles leading up to uh, Christmas. I mean, there were low loaders in and out here every single day. And then suddenly they just closed the account. So it's been six months since you've been able to sell one of these tanks. It's actually these tanks right here behind you can see on your screen. But for people listening on radio, they're troop carriers, so they're a little bit smaller. They don't have a big barrel gun. No. What was the reason that Barclays and Wise have given to you as to why they've closed your bank accounts, which I think you've had for upwards of 40 years? 45 years with Barclays, yeah. Never bounced a cheque, never gone overdrawn. And I think that might be the problem. I'm what you call low profit, but possibly high risk in their opinion. I don't think I am high risk because every single vehicle that's left here has been checked by the Department of Trade and Industry, which I think are now called the Department for Business and Trade. They change those names yeah. quite a lot. They checked, so, uh, they checked all of your accounts and uh, give an export licence over to the yeah. people that use for getting these vehicles out to Ukraine. We checked with them what you said. They follow a strict risk very, assessment very strict. framework. Yeah. So they say that your dealings are all business legitimate. So yeah. why do you think that Barclays said that it's OK for them to close your account? Um, there's draconian rules on um, any type of banks that get involved in money laundering or anything like this. And I think maybe Ukraine have got a bit of a reputation that in the past. Um, I think they should give some kind of dispensation because a potential bit of money laundering is a lot less important than Ukrainian lives. And that's why you're doing this. You know, you've been in this yeah. business for a long time, but it, you, know, you don't sell tanks very often. You don't sell these vehicles very often, unless maybe it's to a, a, another yeah. dealer in America. Collectors in America, they love the occasional tank. Um, incidentally, they have to be deactivated twice. How about that? Isn't it nice to think the, uh, the uh, Americans have to have it of less kind of gun left in it than in England? Yeah. And just uh, quickly, where do you think this ends? We, you know, we've heard so many stories recently, particularly the, the one about Nigel Farage losing his bank account. Um, where does this go from here? I want to know why. And if they've lied to me about why they've cancelled my bank account, the same as they lied to Nigel, um, one or two people have said it should be more important because it's not just reputation, it's not just business, it's lives. It is lives because you're trying to get these tanks over to Ukraine. Um, it's people from all sorts of political persuasions, isn't it, Nigel? All sorts of yeah. backgrounds, but the one common factor is that they're losing their bank accounts. What it is, and I have to say, Nick... Um... I love the look of that place. I want to come and visit. It looks terrific. But what is so bizarre here, you know, I suspect it could be that you're involved with military kit and that's what the bank don't like, but I think it's because you're doing business with Ukraine. As you say, they had a very dodgy reputation. But the bizarre thing is our foreign policy is to support Ukraine. And here you are effectively sending armoured personnel carriers. Quick question, Nick, have you written to the Defence Secretary. Nigel's got a question for you. He says it's our policy, the foreign policy, to help Ukraine. Have you spoken to anybody, the Defence Secretary or anybody at the MOD, about why they think this is happening? Um, Lord Attlee, John Attlee, or, or Earl Attlee, in the House of Commons, as um, House of Lords, has, he's basically made lots of inquiries. And they seem to be saying it's just because of the risk factor.
that if they get in broad in any kind of money launder or anything like that, the fines against banks from the government are massive. Um, we need some kind of dispensation. And I think that with, um, with uh, all the licences that have to be granted, I think it's pretty safe. Nick, thank you so much for talking to us on well. GB News tonight, especially getting over a cold as well. Yes. So thank yeah. you very much. I'm out of my bed. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> Great stuff. There we are. Detanking. Never thought I'd do a story under that headline. A Barclays spokesman in response said, we would only withdraw banking services from an individual business in exceptional circumstances, really. Uh, and then Wise actually put Nick in the same position. And a spokesperson said, under the terms of our policy, we are unable to offer our services to individuals involved in the sale of weaponry and our military or semi-military goods and services. This includes the sale of non-combat military vehicles, regardless of their destination or whether a business has obtained an export licence. You see, this is what I've been talking about, and well done, Wise, for being honest. People involved in legal, lawful activities, and yet modern-day banks say, oh, no, 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 we're going to take a moral position on this. Sticking with banks, a request... Please, if any of you have ever worked in the past for NatWest, I want to know what clauses were in your contract when it came to client confidentiality. And do you know anybody that was sacked by NatWest because they broke a client confidence? Uh, because I want to find out how it is that Dame Alison Rose is still in line for a £2.43 million payoff. Sticking with NatWest, down in Brighton, a well-known mural wall which NatWest took. And this picture of Marcus Rashford, colourful picture of Marcus Rashford put up on the wall. But the problem was, next to it, NatWest put up a sign on someone's fence without asking permission, and there is one hell of a row going on. The owner of that particular wall is not very happy. There we are, banks do often get things wrong. In a moment, we discuss the inflation figures. Does that mean interest rate rises have now come to an end? And will Rishi Sunak, of the five big pledges he's made, will the one on inflation actually work? The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel like all families we have arguments every now and then but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. 
We don't hold back. We're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. At seven o'clock this morning, we got the latest inflation figures. And yes, inflation is coming down. Strange in one way, because actually wages are going up and the Bank of England, uh, led, of course, by a man who I don't really think ought to be there, Andrew out to lunch, Bailey, has got a big dilemma. Does he go on putting up interest rates? And will, the big political question, Rishi Sunak meet one of his five key pledges? Joining me, Liam Halligan, GB News' business and economics editor. A long, busy day, Liam. Inflation down, pretty much in line with what we expected. It is, Nigel. Good news and bad news in these numbers. Inflation has come down from 7.9% during the 12 months to June to 6.8% yep. during the 12 months to July. A pretty chunky reduction in anyone's money. Having said that, it's still over three times the Bank of England's 2% target. We're still very high compared to the Eurozone. 5.5% uh, uh, inflation, 3.2% in America. This reduction in inflation, it's not enough in my book to force the Bank of England to stop raising interest rates. I think they should have stopped raising interest rates I months ago. I don't think they should stop raising yeah. interest rates, but will they stop no, raising interest I, rates? I doubt very much. And the reason I doubt that very much is because they haven't got the intellectual grit and determination. They're trying to salvage their battered credibility. They were late to start raising rates, in my view. They were too mm. uh, feeble uh, uh, and lacked boldness when they did start raising rates. So they've got to raise them now beyond the point at which it's necessary. This is counterproductive. They're at risk, actually, of driving the UK economy into a recession. Looking towards the last quarter Indeed. of this year. Wages still going up. Wait, we, yesterday we had wages... It's good news for work. It is. It, look, we just had the largest increase in wages for almost 20 years in terms of absolute n number terms. And for one month, <laughs> wait, so far, wages have been higher than inflation. So... Is this the end of the cost of living crisis? No. Is it the beginning of the end? Possibly. Fingers and toes crossed. Possibly. Yeah. But the thing about these higher wages, two things. One is that they're an average. Average public sector wages went up 9.6% across the board, 8.2%. You know, people don't live in averages, people that didn't get a pay rise, people working yeah. in the gig economy part-time. No, it just amuses me, Liam, that, you know, economists saying, isn't it terrible that wages are going up? <laughs> well, actually, no, it's quite good for people. You but know. the other bad thing is, indeed, that that wage inflation will be the main reason why the, 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 the people on the Bank of England who are determined to keep raising rates will win the argument. Yeah, I, I get that. Now, Rishi Sunak, five big key pledges. Well, one of them on the, in the English Channel not working out too well. But he made a pledge to halve inflation. When he made that promise, inflation was about 10.7%. So he needs it to be 54 By the end of the year. Yeah. And he, I think he may get there, but if he gets there, it will be nothing really to do with what he's done. It will be largely global events. i tell you what will determine whether or not he gets there, Nigel. Geopolitics. Will war in Ukraine really kick off causing another spike in energy prices this autumn? If it does cause a spike in energy prices, he's not going to meet his target. If it doesn't, then he probably will. Whether or not he does has nothing to do with what he does. No. And if there is a geopolitical energy price spike, nothing that the Bank of England does can do anything about that. So raises, further rises in interest rates would be irrelevant and even yes. more counterproductive. What may help him, ironically, and again, nothing to do with him, is the state of the economy in China. I think that's true. The global economy, uh, uh, the Chinese economy is slowing. The China actually has deflation. It's got negative yeah. inflation. And that could slow down price rises 
around the world. Also, uh, the, what, what I think will be a big issue is the extent to which the UK can manage to contain any energy price rises, whether or not the government's willing to put more money in to subsidise any spike in energy prices. Look, this is a scenario. I'm not saying it's going to happen. No. Yeah, my central sort of forecast in my mind is that he will hit his target. I'm talking about things that could knock this off course. Yeah, but I think the China thing's really interesting. And because anyway, people think, oh, well, China just grows and grows and grows, they get richer and richer. But actually, there's a big reversal. There's a big reversal going, going on, country. which could have really big political implications in China. Because the deal in China is as long as you keep growing, then the middle classes won't mind that the fact that they live in a dictatorship. Well, it's a slightly different tack, Liam. But my fear is <laughs> if, the, uh, if the Chinese economy continues to go down the way that it is, it makes an invasion of Taiwan next year more likely. It's a separate issue, but it is linked. Now, my what the Farage moment was going to be about an Irish cash machine, but given <laughs> Liam, Liam's family hail from Ireland that it is a wonderfully, dare I say it, Irish story. Steady. Is, you know, well, I knew I'd get I know trouble. where you live, Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> Liam, the what the Farage moment by Liam Halligan. This is really a really interesting story that is funny. It's got a serious underbelly, though. And I heard about it yesterday because my daughter actually lives in, in, in Dublin. Look, you've got Bank of Ireland, which isn't the Irish central bank. It's the biggest commercial bank in Ireland. It, it's, it's got most current accounts. It dominates Irish life, along with Barclays, actually, is important there, but also allied... Irish and a rumor went round yesterday. This is so Irish that you could withdraw money from a cash machine even if you didn't have the money in your account. I love it. <laughs> and it, and and it, and and it was people were queuing up and it was going around the pubs and Irish social media was going ballistic. <laughs> and then the Bank of Ireland issued an edict this Look morning. Look at these pictures. <laughs> Look at these pictures. <laughs> the, the Bank of Ireland then issued a statement: any money that's withdrawn, it will come off your ballot. We are watching. But look, there's a serious point here because not so long ago, actually, in 2021, Bank of Ireland, which, as I said, plays a crucial role in, in, in life, in, in not just the Republic of Ireland, but Northern Ireland as well, it was fined 25 million euro, the thick end of 20 million quid, by the central bank because it was seen that its IT continuity processes weren't up to snuff. What does that mean? It means how a bank would cope if there was a sort of major IT failure or a hack. And all you know, all companies have business continuity strategies, of course. And so Bank of Ireland was fine. So it has got a sort of slight, you know, doubt over its IT capabilities um, in the past. And one thing that really... You'd like this, uh, Nigel. Here's a quote. Uh, it was in the Irish Times, actually, yes, uh, this morning. One man queuing outside an ATM in Stony Batter, Dublin. Now, Stony Batter's the kind of place in Dublin you wouldn't like. It's really trendy. Lots of people with sort of <laughs> little beards and funny <laughs> shoes and oak milk lattes and so on. And, and this guy in Stony Batter, he said... He, he, he said, I don't know if I'll get away with it, he says, withdrawing cash he hasn't got... But it's worth a shot. I know, I'm with him. I'm with him. <laughs> and funnily enough, for last thing, in the Republic, everyone was trying to withdraw cash. But in Northern Ireland, a lot more stayed, a lot more buttoned up. There was none of that. Wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Liam, thank you. And Liam and I will be together tomorrow with a little initiative on I Don't Kill Cash campaign. Can't say Can't too much. tell you what it is at the moment. But it does resemble a Pink Floyd album cover. It's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> be... Liam, thank you so much. And one more thought before the break. Let's have a bit of English nationalism, shall we? The Lionesses won. Yes, they won. They beat the Matildas. They beat Australia 3-1. Absolutely terrific. They're through to the final on Sunday. They'll be playing Spain, and they are the favourites to win, and we very much hope that they do. But, you know... When politicians pretend to be big sports fans, it doesn't always work. Let's have a look at this picture of Sir Ed Davey. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. There's Ed, surrounded by spads, by politicos, pretending that it's a really big moment, utterly, entirely posed for the camera. All I can say, Sir Ed, is sad, so sad, so cringe-making, it's not even true. Now, a couple of years ago, I proposed with Richard Tice that maybe the time had come to think about having a referendum on net zero. And truth is, we were just way too far ahead of the game. And the initiative at that moment went nowhere. But it's coming back. There's a group of Red Wall Tory MPs 
think we ought to have a referendum. In a moment, we're going to have a debate on this because is it appropriate to have referendums on issues that are non-constitutional? Would it turn us into Switzerland? Would that be a bad thing? Net zero. Referendum in just a moment. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. mental? Pretty mouth. OK, here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Oh, I love a good referendum. Absolutely. If we hadn't had a referendum on our membership of the European Union, we absolutely would still be members of it. Why? Well, because the political class were completely out of touch with the country on a fundamental constitutional question. So let's begin this debate tonight on whether there should be a referendum on net zero with that very big question. Are we a country that ought to have referendums or referenda, depending on your choice, on these issues. And joining me in the studio is Sean Spears, Executive Director of the Green Alliance and former Chief Executive of the Council for the Protection of Rural England. And down the line, joining me, Red Waller, Scott Benton, Conservative Member of Parliament for Blackpool South. On the big constitutional stuff, Sean, you know, I, of course, was agitating for that EU referendum for what, about a quarter of a century or something like that? And we had the referendum, and it was interesting that, actually, the country was not a different place on that issue to Westminster. Would it be appropriate to have a referendum, in your opinion, on an issue like this? 
I just think it's a really bad idea. I, th I, th I saw Craig McKinley in The Telegraph saying it's a complex issue. It really is a complex issue, and a complex issue with one question. Sorry, are you saying people are too stupid to vote on complex things? Well, you ask one question about something that's, that's multifaceted. How, how does that, that work? Yes, but it's about a principle. It's about a direction in which we're going, isn't it? I mean... Yes, it, it is, but also there's no evidence whatsoever that people don't want net zero. I mean, climate is, is polling third in, in, t in terms of public concern at the moment. Uh, every country around the world is going for net zero. That's a Swiss just had a referendum on it, which they let's come to rejected. that. Let's come to the subject. Yeah. Just on the big point, you know, critics of this would say that direct democracy, outsourcing big decisions to the public, be they straightforward or complex questions, that no, this is the job that a representative parliament does, and that if we do this, we become Switzerland. Where would you sit on that? I think I'd agree with that. I, I, I think it would be very divisive and we'd lose years of the energy that needs to go into tackling the climate change, which people are so worried about, arguing about whether we have a referendum right. or the question should be... Inside. Well, Scott Benson, you're a relative new boy in Parliament, a 2019 Red Waller. Um, do you think it would be appropriate to have a referendum on an issue like this? Good evening, Nigel. Well, we saw in 2016 that politicians such as yourself were light years ahead of the Westminster bubble when it came to leaving the European Union. And I'm afraid that net zero once again is an issue where my constituents who are paying through the nose with the high cost of energy are years ahead of politicians. When you ask my constituents, do you support net zero? Of course, they say yes. However, when you ask them, with the costs involved, are you prepared to meet these costs as a household to achieve net zero? Their answer then changes to absolutely not. And I'm afraid if we leave this issue in the hands of the Westminster bubble, then we'll be waiting years and years for change. I'm pleased yeah. to see a bit of the political prevailing wind has changed for <coughs> a Nuxbridge by-election, but it's not enough. Why not put this issue to the people and let them decide? Scott Benson makes a very powerful point, Sean which is actually, as all the parties are committed to this, as it's been signed into law... Amazing, Theresa May signed it into law without even having a vote in the House of Commons, that we're committed to a rolling series of five-year plans. That actually, if I'm a voter at the next election and I've got grave reservations, not about the climate debate, but about what we're doing in the name of the climate debate, I can't register a protest against that, can I? Well, you could, you could vote for... And the Brexit party was the only party last time that said no to it, and they got 2% of the vote. So they well, yeah, well, yeah. Everybody else stood, stood for it. People like Scott signed up to their manifesto. When the realistic Scott could choice... Tried to fight the... When the realistic choice of who is going to form the next government of the United Kingdom is the Labour or Conservative party. Yeah. And, you know, maybe the Lib Dems could be in a coalition. It's unlikely. Maybe the SNP, even more unlikely. When realistically in, you know, 85% plus of the country, you're going to get a Tory or Labour MP. Yeah. When both of them are signed up to net zero, unless we have a... Rep there's no way of having a proper public debate, is there? No, but there are debates within the parties, and there's a debate at the moment within the Conservative Party. Scott and others are saying no... But no choice for the electorate. Well, if, if they... There will be a choice if the Conservative Party choose to go against net zero. The problem is they, they know from they polling won't. They won't. that a quarter of their votes will be lost. No, but they won't do it. They <laughs> no, won't, they won't do, it. do it because people want it. <laughs> no, they won't do it because they've signed us... They've signed it into law. The point... The big point the I'm trying to get change, to... Nigel. The big point I'm trying to get to here is we get situations in this country where there is a political consensus in Westminster, a media consensus in mainstream media, and for people out there who disagree, what can they do? What can they do? They, they, can, they can... Yeah, I think you can argue for a referendum if you want. Well, well, well I, I, I think I almost am in this yeah. conversation. Scott, I mean, you know, Sean makes the point there is a debate now going on within the Conservative Party, but let's be frank, those of you that are sceptical about the cost, and frankly the cost to ordinary folk, of net zero policies, you're very much a minority in the Tory party, aren't you? That's sadly very much so, um, Nigel. Sadly, we are. There's a number of people, Craig McKinley foremost among us, who are making these debates week in, week out. I would hope the Prime Minister would take a long, hard look at the Uxbridge by-election. I think that provides a golden opportunity 
to change the political dial on this issue. And what my constituents are crying out for is support with the costs, particularly of energy bills. And I think if it was a Conservative government who is listening to hardworking people who are concerned about the transition to net zero, because let's be honest, it's those people, people in low-income households who are disproportionately paying through the nose for the transition to net zero. If the Prime Minister were to look again at this issue and indeed the proposed ban on new cars by 2030, I think he could potentially reap the reward at the ballot box. So I do hope the Prime Minister and other senior public uh, members of the Cabinet are listening. But frankly, Nigel, thank goodness you are here and GB News is here making the case for this issue as you do on so many others. Well, actually, what we're doing, Scott, is we're having a debate on it. And, I, and I'm with you, but, I mean, we're not exactly going to cut Sean Spears out of this but conversation. If, if I can just come back on a couple of those points. Yeah, uh, ULEZ is interesting, but it's, it, ULEZ is a, an air pollution policy. It's rubbish. Clean, clean, Absolute uh, yeah. rubbish. Well, I don't think Sadiq Khan's ever said it's about net zero. It's, a, it's about stopping people dying prematurely of air pollution. Which is absolute but, rubbish. Well, that's... The, that's you go out to outer London, where I live, there's no air quality problem at all. But that's what the policy is about. It's not a net zero policy. So let's park that one. I'll have a debate about you, Les, another time. Oh, but but, but, but equally, equally, it's the poor that pay. Yeah, well, we can, have, we can debate you, Les. But on, on energy policy, the reason that Scots constituents are suffering so badly is because we wasted years not decarbonising, not using cheaper renewable fuel, not insulating our houses. And the three quarters of the drop in inflation we've just seen is down to falling gas prices. It's, it's expensive gas and our reliance on fossil fuels... <coughs> Did you notice, Sean? Did you notice, Sean, this morning at about nine o'clock how much of our energy grid was being fuelled by yes, wind. I, I did, because I see your tweets. When I saw right, well, there you are. I'm retweeting Andrew I mean, Neil's tweets. Or, no, I mean, almost nothing. Yes. So we had to have gas and coal yeah. to back it up. Look... But for the first quarter of the year, um, uh, we were producing more... The first quarter of the year as a whole, yep. more of our energy has come from renewables than from gas, about 10% from, from nuclear. Yep. Um, and last year, it was... Uh, the year as a whole, it was 40%. Is it year. fair that right. what we've been doing for the last 20 years is putting huge lumps on people's electricity bills to subsidise renewables. No, you should have gone on... Is it fair? But we've, that's what we've done, isn't yeah. it? I, I, I think you, sh you shouldn't pay, pay for that through people's energy bills. Right. You are firmly opposed to a referendum on this? I mean, I, I think it's a bad idea. I think it's a distraction. Because I just don't see there's much support for it. Though. Well, OK. Sean doesn't see much support for it. Scott Benson feels, I think, very, very... And, and by the way, I also think the people who've been watching the news all summer and yep. seeing the fires and, and the real effects of climate change want to roll out the sleeves oh, and do we've had, about it. Oh, we've, we've had fires going on from thousands of years. Scott Benson, let me give you the last word on this. He's gone. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Absolutely. We've spoken about how it's my constituents paying through the nose of this. I think if there were to be a referendum, we would see a disconnect between the liberal Westminster elite and ordinary people, and I'm sure they would vote with their heart to save themselves well, thousands of pounds per year through energy bills. But if we are serious about having more referenda, such as nations like Switzerland, then why not stop why just stop, for example, at net zero? Why not look at issues such as the ECHR? There's a debate in the Conservative Party oh, at I'd the love moment. Oh, I'd love it. I'd love it. not we need to do that to stop the vote. <laughs> so let's have more referenda and let's see what the people have to say on these key issues. Let's have representative well, democracy. Well, representative democracy. Final word, Sean Spears, quickly. Representative democracy is fine if our representatives and parties have different opinions. If they all agree on everything, it isn't much cop, is it, really? Well, it just might be they're all right. No, they're not! <laughs> <laughs> Sean Spears, always a spirited debate. <laughs> Patrick, good evening. good evening. What have you got coming up for us? OK, did you know that people are turning up at RAF Weathersfield being asked if they've got any family in the country and being told that they can go and live with them? I've, I've heard that. Well, well, we might as well seriously just drop leaflets all over Africa and the Middle East and say, do you want to see your family again? If so, come to prison illegally and we'll make it happen, lads. <laughs> um, so there's that. Uh, A-levels as well. Uh, I apparently know. Apparently universities, foreign students are getting a, a, a break on. Uh, British students, when it comes to getting into universities as well. We're also going to be looking at train fares going up. Is this a way that we're going to end up trapped by net zero, forced to use a train, then you're paying through uh, the nose for it. And, of course, the Lionesses as well, into yeah, a World Cup brilliant. final. How long before their manager is managing a Premier League team? 
Well, I don't know the answer to that, but let's hope they win got a great on Sunday. And the Aussies, the Aussies took a real... I mean, they, they, they're not happy bunnies, they're the not. Aussies, tonight. And after, and after the Ashes, which, of course, they only held on to the urn because yeah. the terrible weather it managed to save them, been a really good, good day. A-level results at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning are my key priority of my youngest daughter. Let's see what the weather's going to be like. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your latest GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. After a relatively dry and fine day today, that will be continuing into Thursday as well. And even into the overnight period, a good chunk of Wales, central southern areas of England, even Northern Ireland, holding on to some late sunshine and clear intervals overnight might allow for some mist and fog patches to form. Across eastern areas of England, up towards Scotland, we're going to hold on to the cloud a bit more. So turn a bit murky across some higher ground routes, but temperatures generally holding up around 13 to 15 degrees Celsius in our towns and cities. A bit of a cooler, fresher start in some rural areas. And generally on the grand scheme of things, a lot of that cloud will begin to burn its way off once again and we'll start to see those sunny intervals developing and it will feel warm once again. We will though start to see a much more of a breeze around tomorrow compared to today. So that's going to make it feel cooler, particularly along some eastern coastal areas. But further inland through the Midlands down towards central southern areas of England, generally rather warm. High pressure, though, is not going to last into the end of the week because this area of low pressure out in the Atlantic is going to start to drift its way in as we head into Friday. So some heavy outbursts of rain, perhaps some thunderstorms pushing in first thing across Wales, England, into Northern Ireland as well. That will tend to peter its way out, so Scotland generally staying largely dry with some sunny intervals. But we've got further rain on the cars as we head towards the end of Friday, turning quite windy around some coastal areas as well. Into the weekend, though, a bit of a northwest southeast split. Bye-bye. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From six, it's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage. Here on GB News, we will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. 
is the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, a very good evening. It's me, Patrick Christie's identifying as the formidable Jacob Rees-Mogg on State of the Nation tonight. After military families staying on the RAF Wethersfield base were given just a week's notice to pack up their lives and make room for asylum seekers, the Home Office has claimed that some migrants have quit the base over supposed conditions, wanting to move back to hotels. In fact, the biggest joke of all of this is that they're being allowed to move in with their relatives who already live here. It is an absolute farce. I will be speaking to an army wife whose family was moved off the base. Good enough for our brave men and women who serve our country. But those migrants, well, of course, they don't quite fancy it. Now, I am sure some of you have children and grandchildren anxiously awaiting their A 